All right, well, we will get underway because one of the things we want to be is efficient. I know we're all busy. Um, kia ora koto, ko Stephen toku ingwa. Um, e onore e kororia ki te atua. He whakaro pai ki nga tangata katoa. He mangarongo ki te whenua. Um, real welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, it is great to see so many, um, as I said at the last week, so many interested in wanting to support um, the charitable sector and the work of NGOs and others. And I think seeing so many faces, so many different uh, sectors represented um, within the charitable sector is um, really, really encouraging. So the purpose of this call, um, just the really brief background is this initiative started, I had a conversation with Mark Prane, who said, oh, we should get four or five people together. And that last week became about 60 people joining. Um, and it, there seems to be an appetite or a desire to have cross-sector collaboration. So beyond anything we discussed, that's what I hope is being generated by our call today. So let's just keep that in mind as one of the fundamentals. Um, what we're gonna do is um, hear from some people, some updates. Um, I think it's important to hear from different parts of the sector, including charity services. And then um, what I'd like to do is break us out into different rooms to discuss this draft letter that I sent around and also some other material that I sent before the meeting. Um, I'm really keen to get everybody's perspective and realize that we all represent slightly different angles, if you like. So it's important to hear everyone. Um, but also at the end of the day, we want to keep this to one page if we can and get to the fundamental points. Um, so just before we um, talk about that, um, I'm hoping that Sarah is online. Um, Sarah Doherty. Thank you, Sarah. You, you had mentioned last week some things about self-care and do you mind just reiterating some of those points before we get into the sector updates? Sure. Oh, kia ora pano. It's lovely seeing all um, familiar faces across the screen. Um, we're back again after another week of adjusting and starting to think into a new normal and what might that become. And um, really what I've got to offer today, I'll, I'll give it to Stephen, maybe we can attach it in the YouTube notes underneath this call. But um, to Paul, which is the uh, Workforce Development Organisation for the Mental Health Sector, put out just a brief one pager about working well at home and it's a, a holistic take there's just some ideas in there for you to be thinking about because we're going to be um, increasingly working to the the edge of our um, flexibility and capacity for a little while and i just want to reiterate again just how important it is to be really taking care of ourselves so that we can be doing this important work on behalf of others so i'll forward that to Stephen and um, we can make that available to everybody. So just really remembering that self-care as we keep doing the work that we need to be doing. Kia ora. Kia ora. Sorry I'm late. No problem, thank you. So if you're not speaking, if you can put it on mute, that would be great, that way it won't flip to your um, screen. Um, so I just asked a couple people to say a few words and again we're going to move quickly through just so that we're hearing from what other people are going through because um, I think it's important to have uh, ability to share our experiences. So first just I would be interested Andrew if you're on the line um, what's going on at Charity Services and just give us an update from that perspective. Um, um, just for those who um, haven't met me before or are coming in and weren't there last week, I'm, I'm Manager Engagement Business Improvement from Charity Services, the, um, who administer the Charities Register. So last week I outlined how Charity Services put a temporary um, halt on our reminders process and any action about compliance with reporting. Um, and just to be clear, because we've had a few queries come in on that from the, uh, over the last week, we will be contacting all charities after this period to kind of let them know their current state um, and, and, and remind them about their current um, reporting process. Um, and I encourage everyone and through your networks just to do um, uh, 
even if you don't um, file your annual returns now, and I think most entities won't be in the position to be able to do it because they'll be away from their offices, they might not have the right uh, materials, do log in to the portals if you're able and update primary contacts if those change, because that's where, where we tend to up losing contact with charities. Um, and, and the same for the minute, um, for the MB registers, so incorporated societies and charitable trusts, just so all those records remain updated. Otherwise, we'll very quickly over this period lose touch with people, and I think that's the, that would be a really bad outcome. Um, we're still working with Ministry of Business, Innovation, Employment, Inland Revenue, and Ministry of Social Development on clear guidance for how the wage subsidies applies to charities. That that came out really clearly from last week. There was a lot of um, this still a little bit of confusion and recognition that some of the materials are quite commercially focused and people don't quite know how they apply in the charitable world. So I think everyone's really committed to trying to produce the materials that really clearly translate um, into the charitable world that stuff to make sure that everyone knows their entitlement. Um, and we, we as a unit really want to hear about what you, and, and that's why we're here, we've got Kate and Francesca on the line who are part of our team, um, how you're adapting, and um, what the challenges are you're facing and what we can do to help. That's, that's really what we want to hear about. Um, also, quick, quick congratulations to Comprehensive Care, Fred Hollows Foundation. I see Craig's on the call here. So, um, um, Bellyful New Zealand and Reading Revolution um, for the winners of the 2020 Charity Reporting Awards. Important to kind of recognise and celebrate those little things that are happening around the edges. And thanks to the judging panel who, who still remotely tried to figure it all out, which is, a, I understand, a reasonably challenging um, experience. Um, and um, a little call out to the professions, accountants, lawyers, and as well as a lot of the umbrella groups, Philanthropy New Zealand, Community Networks, Volunteer New Zealand, QEA. I'm um, seeing a really lot of fantastic coordination and support out there, and especially Stephen for taking this initiative, because I think this is really good, a good way of getting a lot of different people together talking about these issues. Um, Iwaka Ekenoa, we are in this together. Great, thank you, Andrew. That's really appreciated. And um, just to note that we value the work that's being done by all, all parts of government. Um, that's a message I've been getting lots of emails and that's one thing everybody recognizes. Everybody is working much harder than they normally would. And so we do appreciate that. Um, next up, I'd like to turn the focus um, and ask Louise Aitken to speak from Akina. And I think this is important just to hear from the edges of the sector of what's going on. So um, it would be great to hear you, um, Louise, just give us an update from the sort of social enterprise angle and some of the things that you're seeing. Kia ora, thank you, um, Stephen. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Louise te koinua, ko Akina Foundation te komahi, uh, no paniki ahau. Um, my name's Louise, I'm the Chief Executive of the Akina Foundation. It's also nice to see a number of familiar faces out there. Um, sorry I wasn't able to join last week. Um, and um, our big focus over the last 10 days has been really and to understand how we can quickly support uh, enterprises uh, who are, regardless of their legal status, uh, who are affected, obviously, um, uh, from a business sense around the um, immediate um, response to COVID and then, um, of course, the recovery um, of our economy as a result. Um, we're, we're partnered with the Department of Internal Affairs to um, uh, create a thriving social enterprise sector. So the work that we've been doing over these last couple of weeks is how can we pivot our activities to do the most important, impactful things that will help social enterprises, uh, impact enterprises, community enterprises, whatever they call themselves, um, to be able to um, you know, get through these really tough times um, and also to be able to um, start to think about um, how we create a longer term impact into our economy. Um, that's meant immediate response of creating tools and, and pulling together a lot of the fantastic resources that many of you have been creating. Um, and we've done that on our, on our website um, and tried to and, um, translate some of the, um, the resources coming out of government to be more aligned with how social enterprises um, may um, adopt or um, um, bring in some of those um, particularly wage subsidies and other things that are available to them. Um, what we've, um, the main um, part of our activity is around the recovery stage. Um, 
collectively we have the moment, um, uh, we believe, to bring impact into our economy and really create an economy where people and the planet will thrive. I think we've seen countless examples over the last couple of weeks where businesses have not been able to do that to the uh, degree that they should have been. So our, um, our big focus is how do we work with MB um, on, on giving them advice and support in, uh, in what could be a well-being economy um, and what uh, activities, um, capability building, access to markets, um, access to investment may be possible um, and will be enabled, uh, will enable um, uh, impact to be a critical part of our economy going forward. Um, also supporting um, organisations who may be looking at different revenue streams, of course, um, uh, particularly those uh, in the charitable sector who uh, may have their standard um, uh, you know, forms of revenue um, under significant pressure. What can we do through um, models of social enterprise to support them? So lots of work going on um, and we look forward to continuing to support uh, the charitable sector in any way we can. Um, because it is absolutely vital um, as a result of what we've seen that we really start bringing more of impact into our wider economy and, and the charitable sector is a significant part of that. Great, thank you so much. That's, that's really helpful. And uh, I think the word that you and I have started using more and more, Louise, is impact. Um, and leaving aside the legal structure or what it is, it's, it's about impact, isn't it? So um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, the, the final person just to speak at the beginning, um, if she's online, is Roz Rice from Community Networks Aotearoa. And I asked Roz to speak because she brings a wealth of wisdom of um, collaboration across sectors, but also she's been involved in something that's been referred to as the network of networks. And I'm not sure how much she can say about that, but it would be really interesting to have your perspective as well, Roz. Yes, uh, kia ora everybody. Uh, just actually, just this like, 30 seconds before this started, got off a teleconference with the network of networks. And so I'd just like to very briefly explain to you what it is. It's a teleconference and a group of organizations, specifically government agencies, who are connecting up with uh, the National Emergency Management um, Centre uh, in bringing to them the information about what's actually going on and where the gaps are and what the issues are. The question, um, the, the groups that were just on the call was that I just uh, um, took part in were MSD, DIA, Justice, Health, Police, Rangatamariki, MPI, um, and a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, the subjects that were discussed included um, the framework for welfare, civil defence emergency issues, an overview of the network leads, Māori issues uh, from TPK, mm. um, Pacific Island issues and um, or Pacifica issues. Um, NGO and community groups were talked about by someone I've never heard of. <laughs> I didn't actually get a chance to say a word, which is unusual for me. Um, children at home, children in care, uh, issues for the disability community, issues for addiction and mental health communities, so um, psychosocial issues. Um, let me just see, ethnic and new migrants issues. Immigration New Zealand was there and um, issues for homeless and housing, emergency accommodation, financial assistance through MSD. And um, one of the things I, I can tell you that they paid out over 400,000 wage subsidy applications um, from MSD and um, they've done things like ensure that it's easier to get help with food assistance and, and all sorts of information like that. So it, it was a huge download of information about what actually government departments and agencies are doing. Um, unfortunately, um, in that meeting included myself, Tess Casey from uh, Neighbourhood Support New Zealand and Chris Glaudel from Community Housing Aotearoa and none of us got an opportunity in the download of information to say anything, but I took copious notes. Now, what they're not wanting to do is increase the numbers of people that are coming in on this teleconference. There's already a vast number of people and on a teleconference, it's extremely difficult. 
Um, so I want to suggest that anyone who's interested in downloading information to me, that I can then send through in reports to the Emergency Management Centre. Um, I'll get um, uh, some, I'll get, if, if, if you can send out my um, email, um, then I will talk to you offline and we can set up some way of getting that information through. Um, also, really quickly want to talk about just issues um, because it's really great to see several of the memberships of CNA sitting here in this meeting, um, and they're usually people I've been talking to anyway, but um, I just want to say uh, keep sending me information about what's going on in your regions because I'm feeding it through to this uh, network of networks. Um, I think that there are issues for funding out there with people. It's a, quite a complex subject, and so I'd be really interested um, in um, talking to Louise and perhaps connecting you up with other people uh, that I'm hearing about uh, who are having issues in the region specifically, because issues with funding is going to be for the charitable sector really massive. If it's not already now, it will be in... Um, a year when um, uh, philanthropy, as we all know, will have a huge drop in the amount of money they have to share out, and it's already affecting people with um, the um, global financial issues that are um, hitting already. And um, finally, I'd just like to say how amazing I think a lot of the networks out in the region specifically um, but across the board are. The amount of work that's going on and the amount of collaborative work that people are doing. Um, a good example is a little network that's a member of ours in Alexandra who are working with the Alexandra City Council to get uh, support into the central Otago area. Um, that's just one of many, many networks that are now um, really um, from home frequently and often with not good equipment or good connectivity are still managing to pull together um, support plans and checking out on people and uh, organising things like the volunteer um, uh, delivery of food for people for supermarkets and things like that. Um, all that stuff is going full on. People are just pulling together and I'm just amazed and thrilled and so proud of everybody. Um, we certainly know how to rise to the occasion. Still doesn't mean that there aren't gaps or that there needs to be stuff done, but um, huge kudos to the community and voluntary sector out there for the work that everybody's doing. Mm. That's really great. Thank you very much for that, Roz. It's, um, it's good to know that there are things that some of us may not know about, but that they are out there. Um, so what I'll do maybe after this call, I will send a follow up email with um, some meeting notes. And as part of that, I'd be happy to include your email for people to be feeding information and Thank you. sending it into you. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so what I'm hoping to do now is just split us up. Um, Zoom, some of you probably know, has this amazing feature called breakout rooms, which means that we can, um, because there's about 50 of you on this call, it would just it would just be chaos if I just said, what do you all think? Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to send you into six different breakout rooms. So there's going to be probably seven or eight of you in each of them. And hopefully that will give you a chance to, um, first of all, connect with people uh, beyond the subject that we're talking about. Part of the purpose of this call is that we connect with each other and build up more community. Um, and the second thing is I would really appreciate, the reason that I pulled that letter together was more just to get people thinking, stimulate discussion. And having looked at it um, and, you know, I'm allowed to say this, I don't mind if we don't send that letter. It's fine, it's completely fine. All that it is meant to do is to get people talking, but there's been great response from a number of different organizations who've said, actually, this is, this is giving expression to a voice that should be heard. Um, so I'd be really keen for feedback. A number of organizations have written to me and said, we would, be, we would like our name to be associated with this. Um, but beyond the letter itself, uh, 
I want you to be brainstorming and thinking about other things. So if you look over at our cousins across the water in Australia, um, they have written a letter which is kind of similar to the one, the one pager. And some of the things that they called for, I just put it in the chat notes. If, um, so this is something that wasn't in the email I sent this morning. Um, they're calling for things like, can we incentivize donations to registered charities um, by some extra tax reliefs? Um, they're suggesting a $300 million Australian Charities Stabilization Fund. So in the draft letter I'd sent, there was one line some of you saw saying, could there be a fund set up to bridge the gap of crisis for charities and NGOs? So they've actually gone with a number and said, we propose the establishment of a 300 million Australian charity stabilization fund. So that's quite interesting. And then they've, they've also talked about um, the workforce and I know we have the wage subsidies, but I think there is quite a bit of confusion out there over which charities can access it if their funding hasn't necessarily been impacted immediately, but it definitely will be in the future. Um, so if it's okay, I'm gonna send you to your rooms if you can appoint one person to be the spokesperson and report back to the bigger group, that would be great. I think try to keep yourselves to like the three key points that you together come up with um, because we don't wanna, you know, I know we're all busy. We want to keep this short and sharp, um, but if you could maybe focus on what are the three things, what's your perspective on sending a letter like that, um, that would be really helpful. And also any other thoughts you have, um, I think that would be the best use of our time. And then when we come back, if you can report, and the person who's reporting, if you don't mind sending me an email summarizing, that would be really helpful as well, because there's a bunch of people who wrote to me and said, I would love to be there, but I've got another crisis meeting, I've got another call, whatever. So I'm recording this so that other people can actually access it but also there will be a follow-up email because I know many of you are then forwarding it on to your teams and letting other people know. Um, so I think that's what we'll do. So I'm just gonna allocate you all to these rooms. I think, I'll, does 15 minutes sound like enough time? If we can't say what we need to in 15 minutes, there's a problem, right? I'll, uh, I'll just create the rooms now. So um, introduce yourselves briefly and then um, talk about whatever you want, but particularly the things I sent around this morning, the letter draft, and yeah, just keen for your perspective on those things. So I'll do this now, thanks. So you may have to hit join if you've been, uh, great, you're joining. And I'm gonna be pausing. It's pretty cool use of technology, isn't it? Love it. Get get people out discussing in little groups, and then we can all come back. It's uh, we're living in the future. Stephen, just before everyone comes back, I just want to commend you for putting this group together and for oh, taking this taking this role. It's great. It's great. So well done. Oh no worries. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that people seem to be um, feeling like it's helpful. It's a good use of technology, isn't it? Yep. I think Zoom's doing very well out of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> one, yeah, the one company that, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I think that we're all back now. Um, if you don't mind, again, putting yourself on mute, unless you're speaking and, but I do welcome your thoughts, of course. <laughs> it's just the, the thing seems to pick up the sound of whoever is making a rustling noise or whatever and, and that becomes the screen. But uh, I'm really interested in what you talked about. So can we go through the groups and um, hear back from the representative of each of you? And it will be really interesting to see if there's themes or trends which sort of come through having separated you out into six different groups, is there anything that sort of resonates or comes back? 
Um, in my mind, one of the key things that we all know is the importance of the sector and in the rebuilding and in the new world that we're moving into, how vital it is and therefore how important it is that we make sure that people get through the crisis so that they're there to support in that rebuilding process. So can we go with the first group? I think this is the one that had Craig and Andrew. Yeah. Sure, I've been asked to, um, to give the feedback again. Um, so we had a nice little um, round, um, round table where we talked a little bit about the individual issues, but some of the really key people that have been there. Um, so I think basically everyone thought the letter was a really good idea in our group. Um, obviously, from charity service perspective, we've got no perspective on this particular thing. This is um, definitely from the, from the sector, but the group thought it was a really good idea. Um, I think there was mostly, um, most people thought the Australian letter was slightly better structured in that it kind of gave concrete steps. So perhaps some of the Australian stuff could be um, adapted and, um, and passed yeah. over. Um, so we had some some pretty um, some more specific things. Um, international NGOs are finding meeting the criteria for the wage subsidy particularly difficult um, because they rely significantly on MFAT contracts, which is a high proportion of their overall income. Um, that hasn't gone down, but that stuff gets immediately um, transferred to projects overseas. So they're operating like their you know um, expenditure for wages really doesn't reflect their overall expenditure and that's not being particularly well translated so that'd be something quite useful to feed in i'll definitely feed that in through my channels as well yep. um, also the clarity around charities with reserves how much they're using it as a mitigating factor um, and there's a real lack of clarity at the moment around the legal definition of that so getting some clarity on that would be particularly useful um, as well as in general the same kind of feedback we have last week how it's going to be reported back on down the line what's that what that's going to look like for charities because more as much currently as they're getting it on that now would be better um, and so as Sue mentioned this is um, a, a one really good thing that could come out of this is that uh, as a catalyst for people to come together so I think that's that, that in a short um, summary sums up if anyone else from my group wants to feed anything else in that's all good no, that's really helpful. Thank you. And that the key thing I got out of that was, um, and I agree with you, the Australian letter is something that we can learn from and we can actually have maybe propose some concrete steps, um, like you say. Uh, and again, if you don't mind summarizing in just some bullet points like we did last week, that would be awesome because that way I can, you know how these things are, we can then forward it on to others. So the second room, um, this one had Aaron Davey and Dennis Parker and John Godfrey. Um, could your representative please report back? Maybe take yourself uh, off I, of I took notes. We all had a chat. We didn't get to the point about who's talking, but I've got some notes. So. Okay, great. <laughs> um, Thank you, sir. Again, the international perspective was quite important and um, the way that it, it is a different dynamic than organisations that operate solely inside New Zealand. Um, comments around the letter itself, uh, including some kind of indication about the give that the sector can make at this time. Mm -hmm. And questions around who it should be sent to, obviously the Prime Minister's radar is pretty jam-packed. So we talked about, um, uh, I can see if I, Poto Williams, um, Kamal Cipollone, Tracy Martin, just as some, but I guess there'll be others that we wanna be copying that um, into. Um, and, and just noting the extent of the underfunding that was going on in the sector to begin with, so quite strained um, making do already happening. Um, and Liz talked about that report that social service providers did about um, $630 million underfunded. So um, we felt like some of those things were more details that once that um, kind of crisis cabinet idea from Australia, um, there was a lot of support for that from everybody. So maybe they're the kind of things that the group could be working with government about going forward. Um, That's good. Just noting, just, just noting about that the, um, the contracts that have been rolled over or extended out at least, 
um, to the end of this year that that's giving some certainty, but still a hope for more certainty and more predictability. Mm -hmm. So that's us. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Um, so in, in your group, then it sounds like you talked about that idea of the crisis cabinet or a group that was representing the sector to be able to, I yes, guess. Yes, we did, in. and everybody yeah. was in support of, of doing that as a way going forward and not just waiting for government to come back and say, yes, we'll talk to you, but yeah. for ourselves to say, we've done this. Yeah, it's interesting because the first version I did, I think I said, we, we, we suggest that you create a group. And then the second version, I changed it to more like we have created a group, you know, like it's we've proactively taken our own steps and here we are, which I think is um, what you're hinting at. So yeah. the, the third group, um, so this one had Diane Armstrong and Jen and Caitlin. Can you report back, please? Uh, and me, and um, I took notes. So we, did, we also didn't talk about her feedback. Um, but maybe I'll just go through the notes. So the general um, thought was there was support for the letter, um, that it raised the issues, talked about accountability and put the line in the sand. Um, there was general support to send it to the PM rather than the ministers. However, I agree that we could copy them in. Um, something like a new fund needs a whole of government response. Um, people talked about being tempted to add more detail in, but obviously we talked about the necessity not to do that. Um, um, the main core message, I guess, was around the need for services increasing, will be increasing as the funding's going down. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, we, uh, and there was an issue at the moment around organisations being essential services versus those not. So that's restricting access to funding currently. Um, the indication is that um, a lot of the community organisations can't last two to three months in this period, um, not being essential services and not accessing funding and are likely to um, tip over. I know at Huia we've had numerous stories through about that already and some of them are quite well known, quite large brands, but simply, simply just are not going to get the income through cancelled events, through um, lack of donors and membership fees that are not being paid, um, they just simply won't last. Um, and therefore, what will happen post this lockdown period or whatever it is, um, when the government then returns um, to the community sector and says, right now we need you to step up, some of those major organisations or small ones won't be there. Um, and if they're not there, then essentially the government has to pay for the additional services whereas they could give us money now for that. Um, we also talked about things like um, Fund a Future, which is uh, Ghislaine's um, social enterprise, which is finding another, which is unclaimed rebates, sitting at, um, sitting at inland revenue, which is 250 million for four years. So that's um, a lot of money that we could actually be tapping in. Um, that's another funding stream that wouldn't put um, additional strain on government. Um, and we, we also talked about an offer uh, like the second group um, to offer something rather than just ask mm. um, and also talked about the um, UK approach alongside the Australian approach which also has some good um, text and ideas and um, they've, they've done similar you know um, wording up that we could potentially use as, um, as something as more of a basis so I guess we kind of agreed it needed a little bit more of an editing process but agreed in principle to it. We talked about as well a knowledge gap around certain disposition, which is the donation tax rebate that a lot of people don't even know they can access, which then would be, uh, again, directed maybe to Deputy Commissioner on the ERD as well to uh, um, act on that as well. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. I, I, I'm sure you all appreciate that one of the difficulties of trying to do a one-page letter is to keep it to one page. but. Um, it's been fascinating actually for me to get perspectives from so many different parts of the charitable sector because everybody of course has a different angle and a different lens um, and to try to integrate them into a short pithy statement is is Pardon? quite challenging um, but I take on board everything you've said and I yeah I agree if we can um, make it better then we should expand where we need to. Um, I think also, Stephen, it's good practice for us as a sector to have a collective voice. So now is a really good chance to demonstrate that we can do that. Yeah. 
Well, as I've said to some of you, that's actually what I view this call, these calls. That's the most positive thing that I think is coming out. Like the letter is, it's a letter that will get sent on a day, presumably, but actually the, um, the networks and the connections that we're building here is going to serve us a lot longer than that. So I'm actually more excited by the principles that we're embodying in how we're relating and, and collaborating rather than the just, letter itself. I, I just was um, talking to Stephen earlier about um, the fact that I've had some feedback, people going, who are these people who are writing the letter? How, how are they mandated? And um, what is what right do they have to send this letter? And I think we're going to always come across that. So um, I don't, I, I think that um, the positives of what we're actually doing are so great. And um, I'm, I disagree with them because I think when you look at the people sitting in this um, Zoom, uh, the mandates fairly, would be fairly clear before the letter got sent out. But I think we should be prepared for the occasional people who are, um, for whatever reason, um, negative about it. I'm just saying be prepared for that as well, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. unfortunately you can't please everyone all of the time, that's, no. that's for sure. <laughs> but that's okay, we, we'll do our best. Um, the other point from what you all were saying, um, which I wanted to pick up on really briefly, is just that um, how can we give back? I, I agree with you and had spoken with Dennis Parker uh, about this, that we need a paragraph talking about what the sector can actually do and contribute. So I'd actually put that in the next, the next, next version um, and would welcome any input on that. I agree completely. So if it's okay, let's move to the next group, which let's see, I think that's number four. So this one had Helga, Iris, um, Kate. Do one of you wanna report back? Yeah, um, I, I think what our discussion kind of really touches on on exactly that, what the what the sector has on offer. So at the um, so in principle, we we agree uh, the letter is great. Uh, we are a little bit apprehensive about the impact that it might have. You know, the, obviously uh, our prime minister is bombarded with questions and requests left, right, and center. Um, what we were talking about was more almost like a it's not philosophical but more about talking about what are we all about as a sector we are the backbone of our community we are all about kindness we all are about connecting and collaboration um the risk of having that gone is is, is really really great and also the impact of that is really really great so the Prime Minister is showing a lot of leadership and mana in the space of kindness and collaboration and doing this together, we're in this together, um, look, having an outward facing focus. Um, so we're actually wanting to, you know, draw on that and, and pay attention to that rather than having it quite as a legal um, kind of cleanish uh, letter, if that makes sense, with just some numbers and some facts. So that heartfelt emotion for our, from our point of view was not really uh, coming through in the letter, but that's where the sector is, that's what the sector is all about. Mm -hmm. And also from a national and an international perspective as well, just the outward focus. So anyway, that sums it up in a kind of a three lines. Uh, I work with my little team on getting some really good wording around it when we are sending it back to you. So um, it will be a bit more succinct and make hopefully a bit more sense than my little summary. No, that was really good. Thank you very much. And I, I agree with you again. <laughs> it's just how do we convey things as, as quickly and as short as possible, given the pressures everyone's under. But I agree with you. If we could have a little story or something, um, that would definitely paint the picture rather than just here's some statistics. And, and um, yeah, I, was, uh, I sent around the link to that article about sport receiving funding. And it just struck me just you know, I love sport. <laughs> it's wonderful. But what the charitable sector offers, what the NGOs offer, there's so much value in, in what they do that, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that we're advocating and, and people are hearing our voice to the same extent as sport and business. So um, the, the fifth group, I think this one had Cheryl and Jenny and Louise and Sal. Can one of you and Sophie and Cicely? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just go as the note taker. Um, so we, we did discuss some of the same things that have already, already been mentioned. So it's always good to go last because you can just refer back. Um, but we, we did say that it's really important in the letter to demonstrate the level of cooperation that is being shown by the sector. And that it's like never before where people are, um, you know, showing that, you know, you can collectively come together in time of crisis and, and, and referencing things like the open letter from uh, Philanthropy New Zealand is a good example of that. Um, we talked talked about um, the need for to be really strategic and collaborate on the right intervention uh, for Aotearoa New Zealand um, and bring together um, insights from recent pieces of research um, that have been done and how collectively um, we, could, we could all come together to actually create the right um, intervention and approach um, as a result of um, maybe what we are seeing overseas, but make it relevant to New Zealand. Um, we did make, uh, we did also discuss that many organisations in the charitable sector will will be needing a lot of capability support. Um, at the moment. So they're completely rethinking their strategy, their funding models, their impact models, how can they be more resilient as a result? So how can we unlock professional services and capability support um, to direct to them straight away and not necessarily have to rely on fantastic interventions such as Help Tank, et cetera, where it is based on voluntary. So immediately think about how the regional business partners network could be opened up to more than just businesses. Uh, at the moment, you do have to have an NZBR or a, 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 um, a GST number to access that. So how can we make that accessible uh, to charities who might not have that? Um, and I think it's also important to make sure that we're applauding the government for work that has been already um, done as a result of COVID um, and, and things like the wage subsidy and, and the support, as Andrew said, to make it um, more relevant and more accessible to charities, um, um, you know, from, from the communication and, and, and advice given. Great, thank you. That's a great summary. I once again agree with you. <laughs> I think getting the tone right, but I like what you said there about bringing in some of the research if we can, you know, and, and talking, you know, about this, the bigger picture things that are going on as well. So thank you very much. And then the final group um, had Darren and Francesca and, and Liz and Roz. Do one of you want to report back? So I was the note taker, so I'll report back. Um, basically, all our group agreed about the letter, except for one group who is an essential service and they didn't feel comfortable supporting it at this time, but they could support other charities. Um, we talked a bit about it as not being a challenge to government, um, rather a partnering with government to really show government what's needed in the sector because they may not be aware. And it's kind of weird that I'm saying that, but <laughs> that was what our group discussed. Um, it did come up to who is going to be leading this and how are we going to get, get the whole sector on board because the whole sector isn't represented so far. So how is that information going to flow out to the rest of the sector so they feel a part of this as well? Um, and we also talked about it being signed, not by individual charities so much, but by the larger umbrella groups and the larger head office kind of groups. And maybe not all the individual Salvation Armies, but the, the head office. Yeah. And then we talked about another few things, but I'll just put those in the notes. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think if each of you who've reported back are able to send me a summary, then I'll just put it in an email. Um, I, I, obviously, it wasn't anticipated that we hit send on a letter today. We want to do this right. We want to build and, and create the best possible thing. And one of the things I'm really keen on is that this is seen as a positive contribution. You know, we're proactively helping rather than give us, give us, we need you know, it's that tone thing, isn't it? And I welcome all of you wordsmiths um, to help with getting the tone right, because I think we can all agree that that's really important. Yeah, that's good. Um, in terms of the who actually signs it, um, you know, there's about 28,000 charities. So I think we can <laughs> safely say we're not going to get all of the charities. Um, I agree with you, the peak bodies would be great if we could get them to sign. Um, I think some have indicated that they are interested and would be willing to sign. So um, people at Community Housing Aotearoa and Volunteering New Zealand are two examples. Um, but others I know will have some hesitations at the moment because they, they represent a 
their own constituency, if you like. And I fully respect that and understand it. And they'll want to keep their powder dry rather than necessarily signing this particular letter. And, um, and that's fine. So um, we'll just have to see how it plays out. Um, as I said at the start, it's in a way, it's this consensus building, this discussion, this collaboration, getting to know each other, which is, you can't put a, a number figure on this. This is, this is really important um, where, wherever we get to with the letter. Um, so Can I just say something for a moment, Stephen? Yeah, go for it. Maybe 26,000 or so charities, but there's 127 or 128,000 not-for-profits out there, mm -hmm. and they're suffering as well. So let's not forget all the little organisations that have still got a lot of input into their communities and are still stepping up. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to focus just on the charities, but as far as my perspective is that we need to focus on everybody who's um, also on those not non-charity not-for-profits who are working in their communities are just as important. Yep, great reminder. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hear you. It's, um, Stephen, can I, sorry, I'll just make sure I'm on. Um, certainly from the um, view of the Council for International Development, we had a CEO meeting um, yesterday where a number of um, um, our membership um, attended probably about 25 or so and um, I think largely they were in agreement that um, it'd be good for peak bodies to, to sign it um, and that represents small non-for-profits right through to some of our large players um, like World Vision and the like as well so certainly peak body signing it um, might give it more mana and status um, who, mm. who knows but, Yep, no, that's helpful. Thank you. So the maybe the last thing before we finish is that there's been this discussion about some sort of a committee or a crisis committee or something like they're doing in Australia. Um, just before we finish off, because I do want to finish. And if you have to go, of course, that's fine. Don't worry. It's being recorded as well, so um, you can watch the end. Um, but the the question I had several people have said yes we endorse the idea like they've done in Australia from what I can tell it said um, members of the charities crisis cabinet discussed the need to work well with the public service da, da, da. so that article outlined what they're doing um, I'm just keen if anybody had any feedback from your groups like what would that involve here in New Zealand like who would that be made up of or is this group here despite it being as large as it, as it is, is that potentially what this is becoming? Um, I'm keen for anybody's thoughts. And I just got my four-year-old out of the room, so now I can focus. <laughs> um, I, I can add my thoughts, which is I feel that it's too early to make that call. I feel yep. like it, keep talking and I think out of that will come some clarity. You know, we're still um, defining what the needs are and although we, at the moment we are practically able to define some of those things, there's, there's things to come that we don't know yet and it will depend on who, who lasts and who tips over as well in terms of um, gaps and um, our recommendations for filling those. Yep, no, that's a wise word, I appreciate that. Um, let's go with that. I just didn't want to leave it as something that was hanging out there that we hadn't um, gotten as far as we could in this call. Um, so I've just got another um, comment to to follow on really from that thought that Rochelle shared, and that is if we send this letter and the Prime Minister says, absolutely fantastic, need you, make up a group of 12 and get back to me next week, we, we are going to want to come back to this group at least initially, you know, and figure out, well, then what does that look like? Because things are moving so very quickly at the moment. Um, and so I think you're, you're thinking, Stephen, around this is uh, at, at least bringing together a wide range of people. But the question I always ask as well is who, who isn't here? Mm -hmm. And for each of us to be thinking about that, we... I forgive my judging, but we look like a pretty Pākehā screen looking back at me for the most part, so that much is plainly obvious. Um, and then when we think further, we'll, we'll come up with others who need to be here. So just let's ask ourselves that question and invite people. Is that 
that's cool, eh, Stephen? Invite yeah, them into yeah. this space. Bring bring your networks in if you see that they're not here on the screen. I completely agree. Yeah, I mean that's hopefully it's come through in some of my statements. One of the great things about this is that we are coming together, and certainly I hadn't been in the same room with lots of you, but I've been actively doing my own little thing. And so now we're able to get to know each other. You know, I think there's a richness and a depth that comes from that, which will benefit, like I say, for the long term. But definitely we are underrepresented in, in several different areas. So the more representation, the better. And I, and I get the sense that people are enjoying these calls. Um, I think, so I think let's have, let's plan for another one next week. And I don't know what the agenda will be. You can contribute. You can tell me. Um, but I think having a little sector update at the start and then a focus for the call is a good idea. And then a splitting into the breakout rooms where we can discuss. Um, like I said, there were many people who wrote and said, I've got an emergency meeting. I've got this other thing who would have been here but couldn't be today. But they said, I'll be there next week. So let's, let's keep that in mind too. But I'll just do it again. And you know, if it, if it dribbles out and we decide that was a, that was helpful at the time, then that's fine. If it continues, then that's fine too. Any last thoughts from anybody? Stephen, can I just ask, um, so in terms of next steps for the letter, um, what, what is there a particular time frame in trying to get that out just so I can go back to my colleagues and, and let them know? Well, I think, why don't we circulate, if those of you who took notes can circulate to me your thoughts. There was a number of people, um, for example, um, Sue from Philanthropy New Zealand, she couldn't make this call, but she's uh, really interested in what we discuss and, and the shape of the letter and as it develops. So I'd like to get input from people like her. Um, but I think if you can send your thoughts, my aim would be to try to update the letter to the best of my ability, reflecting everybody's comments where I can, and then circulate a revised version of it um, with that updated version with everybody's comments from each of the groups, and then seek your input. But the short answer is I don't have a, we have to send it by Tuesday at two o'clock or Thursday at, you know, I think it, I think we'll know when it's ready that it will be a natural timing for it, so. Yeah, the other thing, people have said this before, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. Like, this is going to be a long-term thing. So I think we want to get everything, you know, we want to get it right before we hit send. Um, yeah. And also in support of you, Stephen, um, it's always difficult to edit by committee as well. So um, I'm absolutely fine with you making some calls on, on some aspects of the letter. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, everyone has their perspective, but it's quite hard to integrate them all into, into one, but um, we'll do our best. And if nothing else, it, I think it's helping shape our thinking about what we represent as a sector and, and, and what we do offer. And I'd love to make it more positive. If any of you have stories that you think we could share, you know, something really short, a, a paragraph or two, you know, the one page thing was just a stylistic. I don't mind going more. <laughs> Well, look, that's been really helpful. Um, does anybody have any final comments? Otherwise, I'll draw a line under this one and be in communication by email. And oh, the other thing is, um, I know many of your teams or organizations would be interested in this. So I will send a link to the video so that people can look at it as well. And I think feel free to share it. Um, I, the meeting last time, I think there was about 50 or 60 people, but the video has been watched like 150 times or more, which just shows the power of technology that those aren't who aren't in the room, a bit like what you were saying, Sarah, people who weren't here can still access and be kept up to speed. So I'd encourage you to, to, to tell people to share about it and, and we'll just grow this thing in an organic and natural way. Um, I just want to add, because I had a conversation with the RD that may be relevant to many of the charities here uh, that are struggling to get the donation receipts out to uh, their donors in print because this is considered as non-essential services. Um, but there's been um, people that have been engaged with a member of the uh, tax working group uh, considering the extension of the um, cutoff of the 30, uh, 31st of March to 31st of May. Uh, so that would allow um, 2015 to still be included in the donation taxes claims, which uh, could actually 
provide an additional lift up for charities if they were able to get this money back out into the system for the additional donations as well. So this is this is this is interesting as well as a, the the RD is trying to move as well, but not as quickly as they we wish them to move. Thank you. All right. Any any final thoughts? I just wanted to say that um, I our trusts the the ones that I represent we um, we always send our donations by email and you may not have all the emails of your uh, donors but um, that's probably the only way we're going to get them out right now and uh, the other thing that we always do which I'm going to do more of is remind all of our donors that they get a third back if they um, turn it into the IRD and the IRD is um, allowing them to upload it at any moment. So going forward, now that we're past April 1, yes, we have our annuals to send out, but if you can mobilize to send them out every two months or something, then those donors would get their third back every two months or however often you send the, send the donation receipts. Great, thank you. All right, well, it's been nice to have you all on. Thank you very much for your proactive contributions today and particularly to the people who spoke at the beginning. It was great to have those sector updates. And now I'm going to click end meeting. So thank you very much for joining. Bye everyone.